Okay, I got a question. How many cat people do we have here? You sick individuals. <laughs> How many dog people do we have? That's right. I never owned a cat in my life until I married my wife. Now, I put up with the cat, or let me rephrase that. The cat puts up with me because we both love Vicky. Uh, but cats are weird. Dogs are smart. If you're eating something, the dog wants a bite, right? The cat, you're just bothering her. She might act like she wants a bite, and then she's going to play with it on the floor. She's not going to actually eat it. Uh, our cat, I can get ready in the morning, flip on the light, and she will cover her eyes <laughs> like, you are bothering me. It is not time for me to get up yet. Well, I read about a couple who's dressed and ready to go out for the evening. They phoned for a cab. I guess they live in a big city. Turned on the nightlight, covered their pet parakeet, and put the cat out in the backyard. Taxi arrives. They open the front door to leave. Suddenly, the cat that they put out runs in the front door. Okay? Uh, they don't want the cat shut up in the house because he tries to eat the parakeet. That's the way cats are. So the wife goes on out to the taxi while the husband goes back in. Well, the cat runs upstairs, man in hot pursuit. Uh, the woman doesn't want the taxi cab driver to know the house will be empty. So she explains to him, he's gone up to say goodnight to my mother. Okay. In a few minutes, he returns. Says, sorry it took so long. Said the stupid hag was hiding under the bed and had to poke her with a, a uh, coat hanger to get her to come out. <laughs> and then I had to wrap her in her sheet to keep her from scratching me and kicking and screaming, I threw her out in the backyard. <laughs> you know, that doesn't have anything to do with the sermon, but I thought it was funny <laughs> seeing that I don't really like cats, and that has probably happened to us other than I don't call for a cab. So, Psalms 103, Psalms 103. Have you noticed just on the heels of buying all these weird looking costumes and a whole bunch of candy, comes, we start getting inundated in some of the stores by Santa Claus and elves and snowmen and all that. Unlike when I was growing up when you saw paper pilgrims and the, uh, the uh, fall colors and all that. It's like some stores have uh, just want to just jump over Thanksgiving and go straight on to Christmas. Probably because it's more profitable. You know, Halloween and, and Christmas are very profitable at stores, uh, but maybe Thanksgiving is at the grocery store. I don't know. But you know, as God's people, it is fitting that we are thankful all the time. Not just this week, not just at thanks, on Thanksgiving Day, but literally every day. Uh, this psalm has been described as the hallelujah chorus of David. I ask you to stand in the honor of the reading of God's word. Psalms 103, and I'm only going to read the first five verses uh, simply because of time. I know y'all would want me to go on and on. <laughs> Lying in church, that's what you do. <laughs> Psalms 103, verse 1, God's word says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth my mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's pray. Oh, God, you are so good. And this psalm, just like so many of the other psalms, reminds us just how good you are. And so, Lord, I pray today that we would turn our hearts toward you and 
our minds. And, and Lord, as, as David has said, his soul needs to cry out. Lord, I thank you so much for your church, for your word. Lord, for your people. Lord, I thank you for my pastor. I pray you just recharge his batteries and give him rest. Give him that family time that we all enjoy at, at Thanksgiving. Oh God, help us to focus our hearts upon you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, the amazing thing as I uh, began reading this uh, psalm in preparation for this is that David is, is instructing or addressing his soul. It, it, it's like he's saying, soul, listen up. Bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. So he's really addressing his soul. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But he's addressing his soul, his senses, his feelings, his emotions, his intellect, his mind. He is practicing in my heart, my mind, Matthew 22. You remember Matthew 22, kind of near the end of the book. Jesus has been asked by a, a lawyer, uh, what's the greatest commandment? And, and he answers him in verse 37. He says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is likened unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so what I see David doing is saying, with all that I am, I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm going to bless his holy name. You know, we used to sing the song. We still do here. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. And the first question I asked myself as I studied this, when's the last time you did that? That's a great song. We all know it. I saw many of you saying the words as I said it. But when's the last time you did it? I'm going to mention later, but I challenge you to do it this week at Thanksgiving. Whenever you have your Thanksgiving meal, we've done this before and it's a bunch of ball and tear bags. I mean, by the time we're through. But it's just reminding yourself of all that God, go around the table and say, what are you thankful for? How can you bless God's holy name? And that's what he says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The first thing he tells us is that we are to praise the Lord and count your blessings. You know the neat thing about Psalm 103? This is a pure, adulterated praise to God. There's no supplication. There's no request, there's no petition, there's no plea. It is simply him praising God. Now, I'm sure there's scholars a lot smarter than I am that can figure out exactly when Psalms 103 was penned. And, and I can understand that. And, and even uh, some guidance of when it was probably was because of where it's at in the book being Psalm 103. But if you just let your mind, it's the Psalm of David. Let your mind run a little bit with that. David is sitting here reminding himself of all the blessings of God. The shepherd boy to king of all the land. If God never did anything else, David could bless the Lord, bless his holy name for what he had done. From shepherd boy to king. From teenager who's filled with the spirit to mighty, victorious warrior standing on the top of old Goliath in victory. Okay, I'm going to make y'all stand up and praise the Lord or something if you don't kind of get into this a little more. Uh, shepherd boy to king, mighty warrior 
over mighty Goliath. Yet, he had failed miserably. The man after God's own heart who had an affair on his wives. That's another sermon. (laughs) I'll let Brother Sam handle that one. He had an affair, but not only had he had an affair, he had an affair with one of his greatest men who loved him and had served him and had given everything for him, risk life and limb for my king. And that's who he cheated with. He's the dirtiest dog there ever was. It's bad, but to have an affair with her was really bad. Maybe this was written. Because can you imagine what all that cost him? This was a man that would, Saul would call him and say, come sing to me, boy. Because when I, 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 I have a ease of my spirit when you, when you sing. This was a man that everybody in town said, this is a man after God's own heart. And all of a sudden, that closeness with God is no longer there. Because of sin. Because of what, listen to me. Sin always has consequences. Always. You may not think it. You may not see it yet. But it has consequences. It will cost you more than you want to spend. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. It is far worse. There's always consequences. But this is written by a man who's experienced all that loss, mainly loss with his God, and he's been restored. He's been forgiven. He's been cleansed. And now he comes and says, Oh, my soul, bless the Lord, and I'll bless his holy name. Maybe it's those of us who have been in need of a lot of forgiveness who recognize just how much we've been forgiven. Matter of fact, if you're here today and you don't think you need forgiveness, there's probably not a lot you're going to get out of this. But if you're here today knowing you've blown it, knowing God has been so good to you, so good, and yet, even as his, in his goodness, I have blown it. You can find restoration and forgiveness today. If that doesn't bring gratitude to your heart, if that doesn't bring thanksgiving to your soul, I don't know what can. I don't know what will. But let's just simply do what he says. Count our many blessings, name them one by I got a great wife. She's going to have jewels in her crown. You don't have to say amen right there. (laughs) That was probably her. No, I don't know. I I couldn't. I got a great wife. She's not a nut. (laughs) Hey, if you got a husband and he's not a nut, you ought to praise the Lord. Because listen, folks, there's a bunch of nuts out there. Isn't that true? I've got great kids. They're not nuts. They live for the Lord. They've got great families. They've got great grandchildren. Big grandchildren. They're so much more fun than kids. <laughs> kids, your parents love you, but you don't hold a lot to your, to your children. One of my daughters said one time, he minds you better than me. I said, I let him do what he wants to. Of course he minds me better. You're making him mind all the time. Don't do this, don't do that. Do it, I don't care. (laughs) Number one rule at the golf course, don't hit pop pop. I've got one grandson that plays golf. Do not hit me. Okay, you hit your daddy. But do not hit me. He's restored him. But you know, not only... Do I have a great family, great wife, great church? 
great children, great grandchildren. I don't have great grandchildren. I have great <laughs> children of my children. <laughs> but I get to serve a great church. And that's you. I literally can name you one by one and say, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, some of you are more thankful than others, but, <laughs> but we do. A great church. It's not this building. It's you. It's a great, great church. And that will bring praise to your heart and to your mind. You see... One thing we don't need to forget about David, he was a musician. He expressed his heart. You know, the Psalms are songs. That's the songbook of the Jews. And, and, and he, he say, I can't imagine these words being said with just dryness and, and, not, and kind of being stale. No, when David sang them, they were full of energy. Why do you think Brother Billy cries at the drop of a hat? <laughs> he is filled with emotion. He's, and, he, and he wants to express it literally like, Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all the benefits you've done for me. Bless your holy name. You see, I see David full of emotion, passionate in all that he did. He would literally dance because of his worship. Now, I understand. Don't run off ahead of me. What God does, God does in order. He always has order. But some of us have a problem with this. He expressed it this way. There are some of you, you might not be one of them, but you might sit next to them, that if I see you not moving during worship, not naming any names, <laughs> immediately I would come to you and say, what is wrong? If they weren't moving in worship, something is wrong. Are you with me? Now, I'm fine with you worshiping the way God directs you. You know, if you weren't raised, raising your hand. Don't ever watch that video about praise and worship. It will ruin your praise and worship. It's hilariously funny, like portable TV, big screen, window washer. It, it don't, don't watch it. It's terrible. What I see is David worshiping and him not caring who sees it or who hears it. As a matter of fact, he wished all could hear it. He wished all could see it. Because my God has done so much for me. He has done so much. He didn't care who saw it. Praise the Lord and count your blessings. It's all over the Psalms. Uh, no way you could read them all. Psalms 34, verse 12. I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim with me the Lord's greatness and let's exalt his name together. Psalm 66. Shout joyfully to the Lord. All the earth, sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awe-inspiring are your works. Your enemies will cringe before you because of your great strength. All the earth will worship you and sing praise to you. They will sing praises to your name. Here's the point. David was serious 
about his worship. You know, I came that close, that close to really messing things up today. By asking Brother Billy to, for, to let me preach first. And then us praise. I've done that before. It didn't end well. So, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Not necessarily. David was singing the ancient Hebrew version of Count Your Many Blessings. Name them one by one. The second thing he says is that life in relationship with God is whole and healthy. Look at verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. You know, one of the names of the devil is the accuser of the brethren. In Job, we, and I'm not saying I understand all this, we see him going before the throne room of God. And before God accusing Job... And every time he says, look at what he did. Look at what she did. Uh, These people are yours, and yet they're nothing but a bunch of sinners. And if they loved you like they say they loved you, why would they act like that? And the reality is, he doesn't have to lie too much. Why would she do that? Why would he do that? But what we see is a nail-pierced hand going, oh, no, no, no. She's mine. He's mine. She's mine. He's mine. Because those sins have been covered by the blood. Yes, we have an adversary. We have an enemy. But we also have an advocate. And his name is Jesus Christ the righteous. You see, your life can be made whole today. My kids used to get on to me because I would use old sayings like, that is hip. And my daughters would say, that is a part of your body, not something that you want to do or to be. Okay, then let's go with a more modern one. Duh. (laughs) That's not modern either. But when you're my age, that's pretty modern. You can be made whole today. Duh. (laughs) Why would you be here knowing that Jesus Christ can make you whole and not receive and accept the gift of wholeness? God's word says he will forgive all your iniquity, all your sin. You say, I've blown it. That's okay. He already knew it. He knew it before you did it. And he still died for you. It says he will forgive. You can be made whole today. Duh. He offers that. We see that in our Thanksgiving. David is one who has been made whole. And he's saying, praise the Lord. Bless his holy name. He's the forgiver of all sin. He sees and forgives our sin. But he sees us as people who are made whole because of our relationship with him. Through his son. Look at 3b. Who healeth all our diseases. Now some people will limit this. To physical healing. That's another sermon of its own. Although I stand before you. As one who has been physically healed. In 1981 I had ITP. It stands for idiopathic thrombopenia. Blah, blah. (laughs) That's why they call it ITP. Idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. It's a blood disorder. I was sick enough to die. 
And once God accomplished his purpose, which in fact was preparing me to preach and to have a little bit of mercy, I was healed. As quick as I got sick, I got well. Now, it took me two years still to figure it out. It's kind of thick-headed. But I believe in physical healing. The God who made us can certainly heal us. But if you remember our original context, he's talking to his soul. Now, do souls have diseases? Oh, yes. Let me read a few. How about fear or doubt or depression or anger or lust or jealousy or pride or greed or addiction? And the list goes on and on. These soul diseases go back to our fallen nature and the effects of sin. But God can give healing to every one of them. You can be made whole today. You can be made whole. Psalms 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. But thirdly, life in relationship with God is meaningful. Look at verse 4 and 5. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness, And tender mercies who satisfies my mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. He forgives our sins. He gives us relationship. This passage, uh, this verse in uh, New Living Translate can be rendered, he keeps your life from going to waste. David had lost his purpose. His purpose was to seek the Lord with all his heart. Others saw that in him. But during the time of sin, it had separated that fellowship with God. He lost his compass. He lost his purpose, his meaning in life. Folks, you're here today and God will give you meaning and purpose in your life. I was 24 years old before I really began to serve the Lord. And I look at life and say I wasted at least 15 years that I could have served him. Whether you're young, medium, or old. So many people work so hard on things that are not going to last. They are temporary. Some of you are trying to climb the ladder to success. You may get to the top and find out you got your ladder against the wrong wall. That there's nothing up here. God says he will give us meaning in life. You know, when you don't have meaning in life, when it really doesn't matter anymore, one day you'll wake up And you'll be empty, and you'll be tired, and you will come to the conclusion there is no use of going on. Very easy to do. You can end up betrayed, feeling betrayed that what you thought was going to bring happiness didn't. Like money or stuff. Power, position, it won't. But God will. That's him calling right now. (laughs) That's him calling you. God gives his people purpose in living. What better purpose for the rest of my life than him? Some of you got less time than I do. Some of you got maybe more time. 
although there's no guarantee. The greatest purpose in life will be spent on him. I'm going to give you six practical things. I'm going to close. I'm just going to go through. Number one, be aware. Don't forget his blessings. Name them one by one. Be honest. Don't be phony. People can see through it. Uh, if you're not uh, blessed because of something, don't say you are. Because we'll all think, well, you don't treat them like you think you are. Be grateful. There's nothing that encourages praise like being grateful, a thankful heart. Be vocal. Tell someone. Sing his praises. Bless somebody else with your testimony. Be natural. Praise God in a way that's natural to you, that's good for you. Finally, be consistent. It will be part of your every day. And count your many blessings and name them one by one. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. You stand, For us to count, truly count our many blessings, it would take us a long, long time. And we would still miss some because you're that good. Lord, it is so easy to complain. It is so easy to focus on the things we don't have instead of the things that you have so richly blessed us with that we do have. Lord, I want to be a thankful person. I want to have a heart of gratitude so that when in fact I praise you, people know it's real, that it's true. Lord, I pray we teach people about your goodness through our lives. What a great time. Thanksgiving. But really, it's thanksgiving to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.